Thank you, thank you so much for being here. And like I said, my apologies to those of you that maybe have heard this repetition. We learned by repetition, right? <laughs> but um, I see something extraordinary on the horizon. And I believe that mothers um, especially are gonna play a key role in this. And I want to unfold this to help you catch the vision of what I'm talking about. I'm gonna kind of unfold this to you. And um, I wanna start by giving you an impression of contrast. I was here in Nebraska a few months ago. I was speaking at a conference. And when I was flying home, I was looking out the window down below. And I was trying to imagine um, how, how big things were down there. And for whatever reason, I, I pictured the Tower of Babel down there because, you know, that's a really tall building. And as I pictured it, I, I thought of the people that were building it, standing at the base of it, looking up and going, wow, this is magnificent. Look at what we have built by the workmanship of our own hands. In fact, we can see it goes all the way up to heaven. We can just walk ourselves up to heaven and bring on the floodwaters again because this time we're not going to be caught. We've got a place to protect ourselves. But then as I looked at that, I thought, how big was that tower from God's perspective? I was just a little bit, a couple miles up in the air, but from where I was, it wasn't very big. And then it kind of switched to, I was trying to modernize it, and so I tried to think of a tall tower. And of course, bank towers are some of the tallest towers in the world. So I pictured a bank tower down there. How, how big was it? And I even took all the wealth of the bank and I turned it into gold bricks and I piled it up. And just from a couple miles up looking down at it, it was just this little dot of nothing. And then I tried to um, broaden my view and I thought, how, how big is, um, I maybe had 50 or 100 square miles. How big was our country? In fact, how big was the world? How big was 25,000 miles around? And I thought, that tower is just getting smaller and smaller. It's still a speck. And then I, in my mind, pictured then the earth as big as it seems when you put it next to the sun, the earth becomes the dot. And then when you put our solar system into the Milky Way, our solar system becomes a dot. And you put our Milky Way into the galaxy, and that tower with all the gold is absolutely nothing. So here is the contrast. As I looked around, I noticed as far as my eye could see, there was light. And we're taught the light of God fills the immensity of space. Think of the comparison of that little tower and the gold and the light of God. We use different words for this light. We use the word, the spirit of the Lord, truth, living water, that when you drink of this water, you will never thirst again. The effect of this light upon us, this, the fruits of the spirit are peace, love, joy, and understanding. These are its gifts. The light is a pearl of great price that the merchant would have sold all that he had to possess this light. So in Earth's economy, the richest man is the one who makes the most money. But in heaven's economy, the richest person is the one who has the greatest capacity for this light and thereby the greatest capacity for peace and love and joy. So the question at hand is how do we increase our capacity for light so that more of it can be released in the world? We see forces combining together to do works of darkness and destruction. What are the forces that combine together to release light? I believe that those two forces working together are heart and mind in combination. Or in other words, the more the heart desires that which is good and true and beautiful and is willing to comply and be obedient to true principles and laws, the more there is the release of light. Take away either half of the combination and the light is blocked. Let me try and build my case for you. We are a very mind-focused, academic-based culture. We lean heavily towards the mind side of the combination. You know when you're in the realm of the mind because you can test and measure it. How far away is the sun? What's the population of New York? The mind feeds on facts and information. We associate reason and science with the mind, which is all about discovering the laws, the principles, the rules upon which everything in the universe operates. The mind demands proof and evidence. Science and mind are very good. 
The heart, on the other hand, is immeasurable. How wide is joy? How deep is love? The heart is the place of desires, dreams, and visions. The arts, music, imagery, poetry, and story warm and open hearts and travel to a place deep within us that words alone cannot reach. Hard-heartedness blocks light. The root of all the evil in our world is hard-heartedness. There's an order to this combination. Notice that the heart develops before the brain within the womb, and emotions develop before intellect outside of the womb. It appears that nature has reserved childhood for making impressions on the heart while it's open and uncluttered, and mothers are divinely gifted to do this heart work. As simple as this combination of heart and mind appears, the world has had a really hard time holding on to the balance. We either lean towards one side or the other. We either go to the mind or we go to the heart. Yet history shows us that when heart and mind, faith and reason, science and art are in proper combination and balance, light is released in the world. In fact, we call these golden ages. So let me show you what I'm talking about, and I'll take you on a brief tour through history. Let's first go back to the 5th century BC in ancient Greece, which is known as the Golden Age of Greece. Here you find Socrates going around teaching people to think and to question functions of the mind. We see dramatists such as Sophocles, Euripides, and Aristophanes keeping the hearts of people warm. Pericles was a wise ruler who has given the people wise rules to follow, but he is also a lover of the arts, and he has commissioned buildings such as the Parthenon and the Acropolis that were built to the highest standards of math and engineering, but were crafted by artisans who loved beauty. Heart and mind. Even the ruins still inspire us. The ancient Greeks are known for their love of beauty and they continue to influence the world 2,500 years later. So following a series of war, the Greeks felt that their golden age was slipping, and so they started to lean towards the mind to solve their problems. They reasoned that what they needed was to build, a, was to build large academies and teach young men how to think and reason and how to persuade others of those truths. They hoped that these academies would produce great leaders who could lead them back into their golden ages, their golden age. But in the process, the heart was left behind. Not only did these great academies fail to produce a single leader of note, the Greeks slipped into slavery never to rise again. Now fast forward several hundred years, now things have gone the other way, and we're, we're seeing a people ruled by their hearts. The power players of the time are the storytellers and the bards who know that they can sway the people to believe anything they want through their stories and their songs. The people are driven by their fears and they're um, based on superstitions and on false traditions. We call it the Dark Ages, only half the combination, so the light's blocked. Now go forward a few more hundred years to the 14th century when the intellectual writings of the Greeks appeared in Europe through Italy and there is this wonderful rebirth, which is what Renaissance means, and another golden age, where for a time mind and heart, faith and reason, art and science combine together. Look at the shining stars of the 1400s and 1500s. Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci, Shakespeare, Galileo, Copernicus, Kepler, Martin Luther. We see Columbus and other explorers out looking for new worlds. Welcome, come have a seat. Um, out looking for new worlds and possibilities, light began to burst upon the earth again. And then man looked around and said, man is magnificent. Look at what we have accomplished but by the workmanship of our, own hand, of our own hands, and they leave God behind and the heart behind, and we entered a new age of reason. It was in this age of reason in, 18th century, in the 18th century that a tender-hearted, kind man arrives on the scene named Johann Heinrich Pestalozzi. He looks around and notices that for all the learning that is going on, the people are miserable 
especially the children are miserable. The people, the adults are so anxious for their kids to learn Greek that almost from the time they can speak, they're hammering Greek into the kids and they're all miserable. And he says, this isn't right. So a great desire grew into his heart. He wrote, I wish to wrest education from cheap artificial teaching tricks and entrust it to the eternal process of nature herself, to the light which God has kindled and kept alive in the hearts of fathers and mother. Love is the sole and everlasting foundation in which to work. He continued, the primary law is this, the first instruction of the child should never be the business of the head or of the reason, it should always be the business of the heart. It is for a long time the business, welcome, business of the heart before it is the business of the reason. He was given charge over a classroom of orphans and um, started incorporating the tools of the heart. He started using story, images, poetry, and song, even though he didn't have a lot to work with. And even back then, there were school administrators stopped by his classroom. Mr. Pastelozzi, where are your test scores? And he would say, look around. The children are happy. They're engaged in learning. They're teaching each other. And the administrator would give the stern look of disapproval. Through his work, Pastelozzi came to understand that it was the mother who is the most effective educator of the heart. He wrote, the eternal laws of nature lead me back to your hand, mother. He faced bitter opposition to the idea his whole life. Who would think but bitter opposition to that idea of the mother as the primary teacher of children? One of his followers was a man named Friedrich Froebel, who also understood it was the mothers who were the most important teachers of the heart. The problem was he knew that the mothers were all overworked and exhausted just trying to keep their children alive. Um, so it would be really hard to convince them to come in and have them do one more thing. But as he looked around, he noticed that it was the older daughter of the family that usually had charge of the younger kids. So the idea came, let's create a school, bring in these older daughters with their younger siblings and we'll teach them so that when they grow up to be mothers, they will be prepared to be able to take on this responsibility. And so um, they created the kindergarten or child garden, a place to grow children. The first kindergartens were formed to train mothers. He thought it might take three generations, but he too faced heartbreaking opposition to the idea. Although both Pestalozzi and Froebel felt like failures in their lifetime, their writings continued to influence other educators into the 19th century, like Charlotte Mason, who wrote, we allow no separation to grow up between the intellectual and spiritual life of children, but teach them that the divine spirit has constant access to their spirits and is their continual helper in all the interests, duties, and joys of life. She taught that true education is between a child's soul and God. Maria Montessori was also influenced by Pestalozzi. On the opening day of her school in one of the poorest sections of Rome, she, were, she read from the words of Isaiah, Arise, shine, for the light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. At the conclusion of her speech, she added, Perhaps it may be that this children's home may become a new Jerusalem, which, as it is multiplied, will bring light into education. She was criticized and asked what she meant, and she said that she scarcely knew. Pestalozzi also influenced Rudolf Steiner, who started the Waldorf schools, if you've heard of those. And then something wonderful happened. There was a group of um, intellectual giant scholars who were scholars in history, literature, nature, art, and music. And as they came to understand the importance of stories, to warm and open the hearts of young people. They wrapped their great knowledge into stories and they loaded them with principles for happy living and fed children with a desire for the good and the beautiful and a faith in God. It's not uncommon at all to read in their prefaces words like, dear boys and girls, I love you. I want you to be happy. The years from around 1880 to 1920 are known as the golden age of children's literature. Balance of heart and mind, faith and reason, art and science. 
then something else wonderful started to happen. The mothers started doing what mothers do. They started to gather and organize, and they started to form start study groups to relearn the art of telling stories in their homes. And uh, that was in the early 1900s. Then realizing the importance of educating a mother's heart, because she was the primary teacher of children, um, and the difficulty she would have had to get away and go to college. The Delphian Society was formed in 1910 with the intent to bring college home to busy mothers who could only study a few minutes a day. The Delphian Reading Course was the equivalent to a bachelor's degree in classic studies and included a study of history, literature, art, music, and nature as well as other subjects. Women started forming study groups and met once a month to have conversations about what they were learning. Within a few years, over 2,000 Delphian study groups were dotted the nation with study groups in every major nation in America. Is it a coincidence that the generation that followed is known as the greatest generation? And then came the 1920s and the 30s, and once again, man said, isn't man magnificent? And an educator named John Dewey changed the course of education for decades to come. His intentions were revealed in a document he affixed his name to in 1933, the Humanist Manifesto, in which it reads, reason and intelligence are the most effective instruments that humankind possesses. There is no substitute, and by the way, there is no God. We have entered another age of reason, of facts and information, of scientific proof and evidence, test and measure, and something has happened that Hans Christian Andersen warned would happen if the mind were allowed to take charge. He said the world would turn upside down. And our world has turned upside down. That which was good is now seen as bad, and that which was bad is now seen as good. Every fault is magnified, and every good is mocked. I hope that you can begin to see why the call for more math and science, more rigorous academics, an introduction of academics in earlier and earlier ages, and our obsession with test scores is actually fueling our problems. We are trying the failed solution of the Greeks. But here's what I can't stop thinking about. This is the extraordinary event that we see just over the horizon. What if we could hold on to this height of intellect? They tell us that knowledge is doubling every 72 hours. What if we could combine this height of intellect with a proportionate depth of heart? Would we not expect to see a new burst of light upon the world and the entrance into a new golden age, unlike the world has ever seen? I look at what technology has gifted us in just the last 15 years to make this combination possible. We have been gifted with the finest literature that has ever been written. In the 10th century, a princess gave 200 sheep, a load of wheat, a load of rye, a load of millet, and several costly furs for one copy of a German monk's writing. In 1999, Internet Archive was formed for the purpose of digitizing every book that's ever been written and posting it online for everyone to read for free. There are now over 14 million books available in the online library, and they are adding 1,000 books a day which gives us instant access to the thoughts and ideas of the greatest men and women who have ever lived. Part of that great harvest of, of books has been this golden age of children's literature, as well as the writings of the heart educators, enabling us to relearn the lost arts of educating the hearts of our children, which have disappeared with this obsession of mind that we're in. Along the way, technology gifted us with a little tablet so we have a portable and convenient way to be able to read all these books. We've been gifted with fine art. In the 15th century, when the great Florentine artist Cimabue completed his Madonna, the shops were closed, workmen dropped their tools, farmers left their tasks, the soldiers were released from the camp, all the people assembled in the streets. The artist was born on the shoulders of the multitude. The picture was lifted up and carried at the head of a procession that marched with music and banners and tumultuous shouts toward the church where the canvas was hung that all might feast their eyes upon its loveliness. All that for one painting. 
Today I can do a Google search and pull up hundreds of thousands of masterpieces of art that have been hidden away in private estates, museums, and palaces all around the world. We have been gifted with masterpieces of music. YouTube's only been around since 2005, but already I can enter in just about any masterpiece of music and watch it performed by the finest musicians in the world. I get front row seats to the Bolshoi Ballet and the Metropolitan Opera. When I get ready to do my dishes, I can invite Leonard Bernstein into my kitchen and I can give him a playlist and he'll bring his entire symphony orchestra in there and they'll play for me in surround sound for free. The kings and queens of yesterday, with all their wealth and power, could not have had the kind of heart edu education now delivered, now delivered to the humblest home for free. This is an education fit for a royal generation of a golden age. I see just one missing piece for this combination of heart and mind to happen. And for the mo missing piece, I need to go back to the golden age of ancient Greece. Scholars attribute the opening of this age to a poet named Pindar, who awakened a desire for beauty in the hearts of the Greeks through his poetry. But who awakened the desire in Pindar? Well, I found the answer in an old children's books. Pindar's teachers as a youth were two women, Clertus and Myrna, who sang songs into his heart. <laughs> What we need now is a generation of mothers who can sing songs into the hearts of their children and awaken their desire to feast upon this great harvest of the ages that's just been delivered to their homes, free for their use. But who will sing the songs into the hearts of the mothers? For it will be out of the abundance of the mother's heart that the children will be fed. Tending to the hearts is the reason that Mothers of Influence was formed. And I'm here today to announce the formation of a new organization. And I'd like to just show a short five minute video to help you get the flavor of this. I forgot to click my PowerPoint. I'm sorry about that. I got so excited to tell you. Yes. Can you read that? I can read it for you. In the snowy mountains of northern Lebanon, there is a small grove of trees. The people call it the Cedars of God. The mountains were once covered by these trees. They are immensely strong and majestically tall. The prized trees were revered and sacred. Today there is only a remnant. Cedars of Lebanon have special significance. They flourish, bear fruit. The roots of the trees were exceptionally strong. This slow and methodical growth anchors the tree growth. And keeps it connected to an underground spring. Then begins the great climb upward. Growing for thousands of years. Yeah. 
The towering trees stand as devoted sentinels. As they age, the crown begins to flatten. And the side branches form great reaching arms. Ezekiel called it a shadowing shroud. An encircling shelter and refuge. We are sisters. all part of the same forest. We are pushing our re roots even deeper. Striving upward in our learning. and ever reaching outward to influence for good. By small and simple things, are great things brought to pass. Mothers of Influence. Org. We see mothers picking up the work that got left off a hundred years ago. We needed that detour. We needed technology to provide the things that we now need to do the work that's upon us. Look at the labor-saving devices that technology gave us to free up your time. You can throw all your dirty clothes in a washing machine, push the button and walk away. You can put your dirty dishes in the dishwasher, push a button and walk away. Put dinner in the microwave, five minutes later you're eating. Turn on the faucet, there's hot water. The mothers that lived for the last 6,000 years would look upon us with envy. But where much is given, much is expected. You are the first generation of mothers to arrive on the scene when all things have been prepared to usher in the next age. I believe the heavens are watching and the earth is waiting. Already we see mothers doing again what mothers do. They're gathering and organizing. Like our symbol, the cedars of Lebanon, we want to grow deep roots, strive upward and reach outward. We encourage the formation of mothers groups, of mothers of influence chapters, to accomplish this in small and simple ways. A woman can start a chapter, even if she's the only member. But we hope that she will soon start to invite others to work, join with her. We need each other for strength and support. The story is told meant that many years ago, a young boy visited his uncle who worked in the lumber business. They were looking at the trees in the lumber camp when the boy noticed a very tall tree standing alone on the hilltop. Full of excitement, the boy showed his uncle the towering tree. Look at that big tree, he exclaimed. It will make a lot of good lumber, won't it? To the boy's surprise, his uncle shook his head. No, he said, that tree will not make a lot of good lumber. It might make a lot of lumber, but not a lot of good lumber. When a tree grows off by itself, too many branches grow on it. Those branches produce knots when the tree is cut into lumber. The best lumber comes from trees that grow together in groves. The trees also grow taller and straighter when they grow together. Women grow stronger and straighter when they have the support and encouragement of others. We ha hope that you'll invite older women whose children are grown, young mothers with young children, high school daughters, single women who have no children of their own, women of all faiths and political persuasions, neighbors, co-workers, and friends. We suggest that you limit your group to 10 to 15 members so that everyone can participate because participation is the key. And as, as you will see, and as you grow, we hope that you'll branch off and form new groups and mentor other groups as they get started. The Delphian Society, which I'm gonna talk about in a minute, declared 
10 small discussional groups in the community will do more to create a new way of life than 100 mass meetings with 1,000 in attendance at each. Don't underestimate the power of this group at this conference. Of numbers may be small, but the influence grows. Mothers of Influence is about tending hearts, her own heart, the hearts of children, the hearts of her home, and the hearts of her community. By tending her own heart, she creates roots that are deep and sturdy. From the depth of her own soul, she begins to nourish the hearts of her children as she strives upward and creates a life-giving home of becoming and belonging. And then she reaches outward to bless the community that she lives in. We have selected the Delphian reading course as a primary way to begin to deepen those roots um, and to gain an understanding of the world. The Delphians believe that there is, no no there is no darkness, there's only ignorance. Knowledge is empowering. As mentioned earlier, this 10-volume reading course is the equivalent of a bachelor's degree in classic studies and includes a study of history, literature, philosophy, poetry, drama, nature, art, ethics, and music. Who can measure the influence of a woman with such understanding? As stated in volume one, if a love for things worthwhile, the lasting and enduring thoughts of, and sentiments of men increases, and the desire for wider knowledge is aroused, the hope and ambition of the Delphian Society shall have been largely realized. Now, we're not trying to recreate the Delphian Society, but we are inspired by what these women did. And we can stand on their shoulders and move forward and take what they've given us, learn from it, and add more to it. As you study, we hope that we encourage you to set your own pace for learning. One mother may only find three minutes to read while she's in the bathroom, and another mother may have hours of leisure to be able to study. Both are fine. Our only recommendation is to commit to a habit of daily feeding your mind, even if you only read a single line of text some days. Our bodies need food every single day, and so do our minds. By d some mothers may find that the reading is challenging and difficult, but by daily stretching your mind, your mind will, um, will expand to be able to fit the capacity that you need to do. That's how you make your mind stronger, is to try and grapple that's, that's that which is beyond your reach. We suggest that chapters meet monthly so that group members can come together and share what they've been learning. Recommendations of how this might look are given in the Mothers of Influence edition of A Mother's Influence, where we've included suggestions from the original Delphian handbooks. One suggestion that we make is they had a set number of pages that you would study as a group. We say that there's nothing wrong with just going at your individual study rate and do it as you are able to. Um, the Delphians designed ways for women to be able to um, use what they were learning and to learn to articulate and formulate the ideas. And that was part of the important part of the meeting was to come together and share these things. The rule was no notes. The rule was you stand and you talk by your heart. And what they produced were women who were confident out in the public arena who could stand and talk from their heart and were educated and very persuasive in their realm of influence. As Abigail Adams observed, if we mean to have heroes, statesmen, and philosophers, we should have learned women. We can't express enough the power that we believe will happen in taking on a study like this. Some years ago, there was a novel approach to um, solving the problem of homelessness. And a group of people got together and they said, what if we formulated a humanities class for the homeless? <coughs> and so they recruited <coughs> members, people of the homeless, and they taught them the humanities. And the people started, as the ideas started to expand their mind and heart, they started lifting themselves out of poverty. It was a mir miracle. And this has been done all over the world. The Delphian course has the same power to enrich your life. The joy and sensation of the mind and heart opening up and expanding is beyond description. A free digital copy of the Delphian course is available on our site, but we also are reprinting it. If you want to have a hard copy to be able to study from, that's also available. 
Now as a mother's heart is filled, the natural effect is she wants to share what she's learning with her children, with others. But there is an art to it. Remember, we've been in the mind part. We have to learn again how to reach the hearts of our children. As the branches of the tree begin to spiral upward, we look to how to tend the hearts of children. So a mother's university has been formed to help women relearn the lost arts of educating hearts of children. Even if a woman has no children of her own, the things that she will learn in this mother's university will add a measure of joy and satisfaction to her life that she may not have. And she will bless all that is in her sphere of influence. The teachers and mentors of this university um, happen to be those great heart educators. It's a small detail that they're not alive anymore. But I've gathered their writings, and that's what we'll be studying. And then I've also added the, um, the research of, modern, of the modern researchers who are verifying that what they said is true. And that will give you the confidence, because this doesn't look the way the world's doing it. This looks different because we're learning to relearn, we're relearning the art of reaching hearts of children. Um, we recommend that you set aside at least 15 minutes a day to look at the ideas that you'll find in this Mother's University, and it's on a 12-month rotation schedule. So you go through, you pick up what you're ready for one time. When you come back the next year, you'll deepen your understanding, and you'll continue this spiral learning of understanding. As your heart begins to warm and be filled, as well as your children, your home will become the outward expression of that which you treasure in your heart. as you create a life-giving home of becoming and belonging. As Angela Maya Angelou wrote, the ache for home lives within each of us. We love Sally Clarkson, who has had a 20-year ministry of helping mothers create life-giving homes. She says making a home is a functioning of making time to love. She had her first child when she was 31 having never changed a diaper, or even having spent one day in babysitting. She had no idea how to be a mother or how to build a home. But she learned. Her ideas are simple and practical, with suggestions for every month of the year. Again, even if someone is single or living alone, you still need a life-giving home to come home to, a home that nourishes, nurtures, and sustains life and beauty. Um, and just a side note, again, I. You know, half of our population are single women. When we talk about the mothers, we are not excluding anyone, any women. And as you form your groups, we hope that you will reach out and include um, all women. That that is a very much a part of the mothers of influence. We consider that all women have the mother's heart that wants to nurture. We recommend that you set aside a little time at the beginning of each month and choose just one thing that you want to implement in your home for that month. And when you come to your meeting, share your ideas with each other. Listening to the experiences of someone else motivates and inspires us all. So now as the tree reaches maturity, it begins to reach outward to provide shade and refuge in the community. Learning that has no, learning that has no outlet grows stale. While we encourage political and civic activism and raising voices in regard to policy and lawmaking, the scope and vision of Mothers of Influence is as a cultural lift, not as an activist organization. And we ask that you not use the Mothers of Influence name in connection with worthy activities that are not part of our purpose and mission. We encourage Mothers of Influence chapters to always be mindful of ways to add beauty and refinement to the community at large. We were talking about that before. This is where you start planting the seeds of beauty where you live. As a group and with your, with your family, consider ways to serve, such as planting flowers in the community, even if only a planter box, reading inspirational stories to children in a homeless center, or donating quality books for the children there, influencing the librarian to increase the number of wholesome and inspirational books on library shelves, placing fine art in public places, joining with other Mothers of Influence groups, and sponsoring talent shows, art galleries, putting on plays, bringing in guest speakers and musicians, writers and poet poets to inspire young hearts, sponsor art and music contests for young people, Always keep your eyes open as to where you can plant a little beauty and add a little light to your community. A lesson drawn from Robert Browning's Paracelsus is this, 
There is an answer to the passionate longings of the heart for fullness, and the answer is this. Live in all things outside yourself by love, and you will have joy. That is the life of God. It ought to be our life. It's amazing what a little light can do. A daring experiment ran in 1982 during the war between Lebanon and Israel and was referenced by Greg Brayton in a book called The Spontaneous Healing of Belief. And I'll read from his book. Researchers trained a group of people to feel peace within. At appointed times, on specific days of the month, these people were positioned throughout the war-torn areas of the Middle East. During the window of time when they were feeling peace, terrorist activity ceased. The rate of crimes against people went down. The number of emergency room visits declined, and the incidence of traffic accidents declined. When the participants' feelings changed, the statistics were reversed. This study confirmed the earlier findings when a small percentage of the population achieved peace within themselves, it was reflected in the world around them. The study became known as the International Peace Project in the Middle East and the results were eventually published in the Journal of Conflict Resolution in 1988. I found an old 1892 book about the 15th century world of Henry V, and this is what I read. Old faiths had lost their inspiration. Old forms of government were breaking down. The very fabric of society seemed to be on the point of dissolution. Sound familiar at all? It is, however, part of the irony of history that a great ideal too often finds its finest expression only when the period of decline has already commenced. The remedy for present, for present evils was sought not in the creation of a new order, but rather in the restoration of an old ideal. To bring back the golden past must be the work of a hero who could revive in his own person its virtues. Henry of Monmouth, deriving his inspiration from the past, was the champion of unity against the forces of disintegration. Is this really so different than the teachings of a humble carpenter 2,000 years ago who taught, tend to the kingdom within and all else will be added unto you? Being a champion of unity against the forces of disintegration is the work of Mothers of Influence. After the organization was named, we were looking at the initials and it formed the word WA. And it made me think of Lancelot in Camelot singing, Say moi, tis I. And, um, and I thought, we ask, who can make a change in the world? Say moi, tis I. For as Confucius reminds us, to put the world right in order, we must first put the nation in order. To put the nation in order, we must first put the family in order. To put the family in order, we must first cultivate our personal life we must first set our hearts right. We hope you will join with us. If you go to mothersofinfluence.org, there's a place that you can register your chapter and you can begin to grow it. Or look for an existing chapter to grow. Cedars of God planted around the world will provide an ever encircling reach of refuge and hope. We believe angels are standing ready to assist in this great work. A little leaven, a little salt, even a single candle in a dark room can make a difference. And we believe, by small and simple things, are great things brought to pass. Thank you very much. And we have probably two minutes if there's any questions. It's mothersofinfluence.org. Um, it's just brand new on this site, and we'd love to have you all come be part of it. So thank you. <laughs>